Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 140, featuring part three of my interview with Mr. David Fox. In this part of the interview, we focus in finally on Zach McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders, probably uh, Mr. Fox's greatest game and a very important game for fans of graphical adventures. Got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. David Fox. So, um, I'm, I'm very... Uh, very happy to hear what happened with Tim Schaefer and the Kickstarter, you know, amazing miracle, you know, with, I don't know what, what the number was, but you know, how, is it close to two million by now? I don't know. Um, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. They, they, uh, that, that just shows how strong the fan base is and how strong people really want that kind of game. So it's great. I think it comes back to what you were saying earlier too, about this, the marketers at these big companies saying, this is what people want. And the people are saying, no, we want something else. Right. <laughs> well, are you planning a, I know there's a, a fan, I don't know if it's a sequel or a fan remake of uh, Zach out there. Uh, well, I know there's several. Um, I, Th those have your blessing, I assume. Well, the, I can't bless it because it's not really my um, property. I, I'm honored when I hear that people are doing it. And, you know, I've talked to some of them before and, and um, since I'm a Mac guy, I haven't played most. Most of them are on PCs. I've seen some some screens and stuff, um, but I I like you know I, I anytime someone likes something enough to put months and, and years of work into it as a you know because they want to expand, they want to see what happens next. They want to expand the story. They want to live in your universe. Um, that that's got to be a huge honor. Um, so I would I would support. It. I have no idea what what Lucas Arts's point of view. I think I think that at this point they're just letting people do it. I don't know if they're actually stopping. I think there was a point where where there are some sites that got stopped maybe five or five or seven years ago that were trying to do stuff like that. I don't know what they're. I mean that changes too. I, I assume if anyone made a lot of money off of that, um, they'd probably be hearing from. Lucas Arts as lawyers. So, have you thought about doing a Kickstarter project for a new Zach game? Uh, well, I couldn't do it because I don't have the rights. I, I, oh, get, that's, I get zapped. I, yeah, what <laughs> would it take to get the rights? I wonder. I mean, uh, surely, I you get enough money together and you can do anything, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, if if you had enough money together, that that uh, made it worth Lucas Arts's um, time to invest in the legal stuff and the whatever else they had to deal with it, then, yeah, I guess there's some number, I don't know if the number is, like um, a few million dollars. Um, then they, they say, oh, yeah, you have a few million? Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll work with you then. So, well, a... so, oh, so oh. you know, check back with me when I'm a millionaire. <laughs> See if I could do it. Yeah, no, let's talk about, I want to talk a little bit more about the game. I was uh, reading some uh, commentary about it and uh, they were pointing out, uh, some, one of the critics said it's the, quote, closest thing to a non-LucasArts adventure that the company ever made. <laughs> and what they were referring to was the the difficulty of the puzzles, and it was, you know, you get the game into an un unwinnable state. Right. So I'm wondering, is that was that by design, or was that just, you know, they hadn't worked out the formula formula yet for, uh, you know, making it easier? Um, it was probably not exactly by design. I think... We try to catch a bunch of stuff where you'd end up with a dead end, and I think it was you know before we had these edicts that said you know never put them in a dead end, you know, situation. Um, I think if if we went back and redid that same game, would we would try to find more of those and, and make it you know find solutions so that you didn't end up you know drowning in the ocean. I think we did let you. I think there was some cir circumstances like if you. Most of them were, were pretty well telegraphed, like, you know, jumping out of an airplane without a parachute probably isn't a good idea. Um, if you do that, I think you had a, one of the yellow crystals, I think you could still teleport away. Um, but um, we weren't totally stopping you. It was, it, it was less, the, at that time, it was less that you could never die rather than you couldn't die arbitrarily. Um, that if you walk off of a cliff you have to expect that you're going to um, you know, you're probably going to not survive <laughs> so we allowed that 
Um, I think there there were a couple places in Maniac Mansion where you could die. Um, and we generally warned you, like, don't put the radioactive water into the microwave and turn it on. Because if you do, then you'll get, you die from radioactive steam. So there, there were several ways where, where the characters could die in that game. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't like, you know, let me open this door and there's no signage or anything. And all of a sudden you open the door and a monster eats you. you know, that, like that, that didn't happen. Um, I, it might have advanced over the years so that it was, there weren't dead ends and there were less ways for, there weren't any ways to die. Um, I think we let the Indiana Jones in, in that game, I think you could die also. Um, there are a couple ways where, where that could happen. Um, but you always had to save games. I think we're automatically saving games by then and and so you weren't totally stuck. Sometimes, it, it, I always just say, sometimes a fun death could be a lot of fun. It was an Easter egg. You know, hey, what happens if I try this? It's, it looks dangerous. You try it and, and, you know, if it's a reward, then, yeah, you find something fun. So, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I think it's kind of fun too that you know the whole theme in the game about the stupidity epidemic and everything. You know, do you think that they just made these games uh, too simple? You know, they were just dumbing down and not giving enough challenge uh, to really hardcore uh, adventure game fans. You mean more recently or back then? Well, you know, just as the adventure game genre sort of evolved after that, do you think? I don't know. Well, well there. I I know that um, Brian Moriarty got a lot of flack when he did Loom because it was a much shorter game than most of the games we had done before. I think people could finish that in a few hours, you know, two to two to six or seven hours, depending on how, how good you were. Um, and I think there was, expect, there was an expectation when we were doing those games that I worked on that, you know, for your 30 or $40 or whatever it was, you should get around 30 or 40 hours. You know, it's like a dollar per hour of entertainment. So we had to find ways to extend the games. Um, one of the ways that we did it in Zack, which I wish we hadn't, were, were the several mazes that we had that some people like, but most I've heard from say, oh, I hate it. not another maze. And, and I remember, you know, I guess one of the things I should have realized is like, if I, if I, as I'm play testing a game and I dread the maze, it's likely that it's likely that someone else, one of their players, is probably going to not have a lot of fun with it either. So I would have changed that. But you know, that was one of the ways to make the world feel much larger by using this device we had, which was essentially reusing one set of art and mapping it into this large environment. Um, I think it's basically one background, one scrolling background with a whole bunch of different objects you could turn on and off. And different doorways you could turn on and off and map each one to a different, like we call them pseudo rooms. Um, oh, the, there was a jungle maze, I remember, in Zach, which a lot of people had trouble with. And that one was probably one of the more nasty things I did because there was really no way to solve it. You just had to walk through any two doors in a row without backtracking and you were out. And that was the solution. <laughs> Um, in the you, there it was it was unmappable. It was just like I was counting doors. When she got through, went through two through through uh, two openings, you have solved the maze. And people would go through an opening and they'd backtrack, and that would have to start over again, so they get stuck. Um, so I don't know. Evil, evil. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, I, we were trying not to be too too nasty. I think there's one other thing I did, which was a little nasty, which was when you were when you're in the airplane. Uh, and you're supposed to pick up a fire extinguisher and the only way to do that would be to open up the overheads after you've done a few things to distract the stewardess and figure out which one it's in and people probably felt that they were always very unlucky because no matter what order they did them in it was always the last one that they looked in so they had to open all of them and then there was always the, the like the eighth one or seventh one that they could find it in so. You didn't get on any uh, no-fly list because of that scene, did you? No, but that that was my retribution for nasty stewardesses. I mean, I was, <laughs> I, I've been on enough airplanes where I had snappy stewardesses, and this is my way to kind of be cathartically uh, get back at, at them for 
for not being very nice. Well, I understand there was a little controversy at the time about the, uh, the the number of locations in the game. I mean, my memory was it was a big a big world, but apparently there was some. Uh, uh, I guess the size of the Commodore 64 discs were, was a problem uh, for the design in the world. Is that well? The the I how, how many sides did we use for that? Was that um, I think it might have been one side for the for the code, and then maybe two more sides for the environment. So you had to flip the discs a few times. I don't remember exactly now, but that was. I it probably meant that the cost of goods was a little bit higher because you had to have more than one disc in there. Um, and I don't know whether we ever had an edict that says you have to have this under X number of discs. Um, but what 160K bytes per side, I think, is what the Commodore 64 discs were. So it might have been two or three sides. I think Maniac was two sides. This might have been a separate one. Um, so I don't remember it being a controversy in house, and no one said you know make it smaller. But I think we just had to keep it as tight as we as we could. Did you want to have uh, more locations and just couldn't put them in because um, of the limitations? I don't think I cut anything, so no, I don't think so. What about all the uh, different versions of the game? I know the it, was it uh, originally programmed on the uh, or for the uh, Commodore sixty four? Yes. And then so, it got ported to all the different uh, systems yeah. of the day. So Commodore 64 first, um, again using our Sun Microsystems as the as the development environment, to then compile down to the P code that Scum used, which then went onto the disks and loaded. Um, then it went over to the IBM to the PC, and I believe we first just re reused the ex existing Commodore 64 graphics, so it was the same exact look. Then I think there was a um, EGA version, which had more color. Then there was a VGA version, which was essentially the 256 color version, which I believe was built for the Amiga and the Atari ST. Was that right? Or is that for the FM Towns? Maybe it was the FM Towns. Yeah, I, I played think. the FM Towns. I found the version uh, for that with one of the emulators. And right. I don't even, I think I've ever even seen an FM Towns. Yeah, there weren't <laughs> a machine. whole lot of them. Do you have the, a favorite uh, version or port or authoritative uh, version? Well, fortunately on, on Zach, I was able to avoid conversion hell. They By then, I think we were able to, we were big enough, we, we were able to assign it to other people to do the project, to convert to other other um, you know, other computers or other you know image, you know, screen resolutions. Um, I definitely got to look at the artist that was being made. Um, I remember the artists who had been stuck doing Commodore 64 art were in, or, or 16 color art were really excited when they got to go to 256 color because it just opened up as like this whole palette and may have gone overboard a few times on a few of the screens where it's like maybe approaching on garish. But um, I, I think probably the Amiga or ST versions um, where you have good sound. The FM Towns is really good except um, I mean, I like that they had this real, really nice music that was recorded that was being streamed off of the CD. Um, but otherwise, they're they're pretty much the same game. I don't think there are any changes made to any of those. I don't think we ever did an. There was no Nintendo version. There was for Maniac Mansion. I remember there were yeah, some was some major yeah. major changes that had to be made for the Maniac Mansion version because of. Um, Nintendo's in-house rules about various things, like the there was a statue of Venus that they had to either clothe or, or remove or do something. I think there was a, a pinup of a in, in the bathroom. There was a pinup of a mummy, you know, wrapped up in bandages on a like a Playboy-like calendar. Um, I think they had to remove that. So a bunch of things that that. They had to, you know, tone down, get rid of some of their irreverent humor. I think they missed a couple. Of the, I think they they missed the hamster. Yeah, the hamster in the microwave. They and missed all that. that. They, they, either they didn't care, or they totally missed it because it was not part of the gameplay. It was it was a side thing. It wasn't required to complete the game. So maybe they never saw it. But that's that stayed. 
That was mine, by the way. That was my uh, my evil You're the... scientist. I'm the hamster guy. <laughs> you know, I, I, I saw that there was a hamster. I saw there was a microwave. And I said, no, should I do this? Um, and, no hamsters were harmed in the making of the game. Like... Yeah, we're not in the making. I didn't test it. <laughs> <laughs> but I asked Gary for a blood splat for the, cover, the replacement for the for the microwave door and asked someone for a ding or I had a ding I think I already had the ding for the microwave and coded it up we decided that only certain of the kids in that game would be willing to do it um, the, the ones that were more deranged um, and called Ron over and said you know try this and he tried it and you know hummed for a bit there was a, a splat and then the ding, <laughs> and uh, he thought it was pretty funny, That's so awesome. I got to stay. Yeah, there's a. I was thinking of earlier too of all of the sort of meta stuff that's going on between those games, all the references. Um, you know, I just came across some people talking about the chainsaw in the one game and the chainsaw fuel in the other game. You know, was this? I, I assume this was all planned uh, from the beginning, right? That there would be little elements in each of the the games to tie no, that together. Was, that was one of the things where you, you as you're doing them you have this brilliant little idea. It's like, you know, what should I put in this locker? So I know, let's put a gas, a, a, you know, let's put put the gas that was missing from the other game. Yeah, so like in Zach, in, on Mars, there's a can of gasoline that was for a different game for me and Magic because they had a chainsaw and, and was totally useless in the game. It was just like just a red herring. But whenever you ask to use it, you say, I can't find the gas. There is no gas for it. And so I, but there was, there was no gas in the game. So it's one of those things that we did, which was probably also very mean, you know, that was in there because it was funny in a way to have it. Um, I think the blood on the walls turned out to be ketchup. So um, all these things that were just kind of more for window dressing, um, but wasn't really part of the gameplay. Um, yeah, I played. Oh, go ahead. I, I was going to say that that became one of our. Um, I guess the earmarks of a Lucasfilm game was to have Easter eggs that referred to our other games throughout the whole thing. So we, you know, like in, in Zach, we had, there was a rotofoil sitting on top of a cabinet inside of the uh, aliens secret bunker. Um, there are posters from other games and, and all the games we referred back to it. And I think they're in Indiana Jones. There's a scene. I remember one of them was in the, um, there's one room where we have objects from all the other games in Indiana Jones's office. You touch around, you can see those. And in the uh, in the Nazi castle, there's where all this artwork has been stored. One of the pictures was a uh, screen grab from Loom, and you know it's just it's, just, it's fun. So people see it, it it kind of makes you feel like you're part of the inner sanctum of of gamers who recognize those things. So. Uh, we like doing it. I, I loved uh, seeing it, you know, as yeah. a player. Uh, now I saw some somewhere where you had said that the uh, game did a lot better in Germany uh, than it did in the United States, and I'm really curious as to why uh, you think that might be. I don't know. Um, I do know that at the time we were doing these early games, the the big graphic adventure company in the United States was Sierra Online. They had the market share. They they were the they were, we felt like they were our competitors. They probably didn't know we existed in terms of doing adventure games. Um, we used their, we looked at their games and took them apart, and not physically, but you know, talked a lot about them and what what we liked and what we didn't like about them. But they didn't have much of a presence in Europe. I don't think they had distribution in Europe. So when we started selling our graphic venture games in Europe, we weren't, we didn't have that competitor, and they became much more popular. I think. Um, in, in terms of Zach, I think there must be something in the humor that we have in that game that just matched with with the with the humor in Europe and especially in Germany. Um, at least with the people that love the games, because that's that's where all the sequels were being done um, in Germany or Austria. And uh, I, other than that, I'm not sure. That I, I, I find it interesting um, that that's where it, it might be also because we did 
we not, not only had better distribution in Europe, we also did um, langu language translations. So we had versions of, I think, all of our graphic adventures in German, French, um, Italian, and I think Spanish. So that made it much more accessible to people back then. I know for the, uh, we filmed some interviews for a documentary project, and one of the people we interviewed was Noah uh, Falstein. And he had, he really emphasized that just the, this bitter rivalry between Sierra and Lucas uh, Lucasfilm uh, well, games. Well, it's, I if mean, it was bitter, it was I think it was kind of like the bitter rivalry that you have with someone who doesn't know you exist. <laughs> it, it was like one way. It was us like always grumbling and say, "How come their games are doing better than ours? How come how come oh, they're sure. getting so much notoriety and, and ours are just you know kind of not being at least in this country they weren't being they weren't as popular." So yeah, I assume you you played all the King's Quest games and all that kind of stuff. I didn't play a lot of them. I we ended up, I think I spent so much of my time coding that we ended up designating someone to go through the whole games and then do a walkthrough. Um, often it was Ron Gilbert. He'd go through the game and he'd have a bunch of save games and he'd go through and and take it apart, kind of like a postmortem, and say here's here are some important scenes. Here's what they did here. Um, I remember working on the Indiana Jones game. And we saw a new Sierra game at that time. So this, this must have been 89, 90, I guess. Um, and they had way more animation that we had been using in ours up to that point. And we said, oh, my God, you know, ours, ours looks antiquated now compared to this. So we kind of re, you know, in a, in a few days, cooked up this whole new animation tool and started doing much more cell animation for not, not for everything, but for some of the major um, puzzle solutions. So you had much more of a payoff when you did that. So we were always kind of watching them to, to try to, to try to be equitable. But we, we always felt like ours were better crafted just because they were, I, I feel like we weren't doing things just to kill you off for no reason. I think the one I remember was there was some game where you were, you're walking up some stairs and you fall off the stairs and you die. And I think that's like, all of them, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, probably. And I said, I, I could walk upstairs without dying. Or there's another one where you pick up a piece of glass or mirror or something and you cut yourself and die. And I say, yeah, come on. I, I've picked up glass. I could, I might cut myself occasionally, but not enough to kill myself by with a piece of glass. And so it just felt like they were looking for ways to kill you, whatever they could. And, so what you said about our games, we were intentionally not looking for ways to kill you. We were looking for ways for you to advance and and have really good payoffs for, for solving the puzzles. Um, but we didn't have that edict that says you could never die. It just had to be motive. It had to be expected and, and foreshadowed or something. Like, you know, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Are you sure you want to do that? So say, yeah, yeah, okay. Save your game first. <laughs> well, Dar Darwin awards are awards too, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I really liked about the game was, uh, you know, this was at Maniac Mansion too. To be able, you can shift between different characters and you know play. You know, the control will shift around. Uh, but I didn't see that. I don't think that that sort of went away in the uh, later games, uh, right? We, I mean, we did what happened to that? Well, we had it in, in Zach. We had, we didn't have the thing where you could choose X number of characters for your team in the beginning, which Maniac had, which um, made the game orders of magnitude more difficult to debug because you not only had to figure out how to win it with with a set number of characters, you had to figure out how to win it with every single combination of characters. There had to be ways to do it, so it just made the game much much bigger, really. Um, I I think what I was looking for with Zach was to make the game bigger in terms of everyone's playing it but not have whole bunches of th areas where you would miss if you didn't play it with a certain combination of characters. So we had four characters in Zack and all of them were switchable. You had to use them all at some point or another. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. 
I should be back next week with the uh, final part of this interview with Mr. Fox. Going to catch him up to modern times and find out what he's been up to since Zach McCracken. Be a briefer episode, but I think you guys will still enjoy it, so uh, stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you if you have supported the show. It really means a lot to me. I was able to get uh, the equipment that I ordered. I'm still uh, one piece short, though, I found out this morning. Uh, so if you haven't donated yet and you uh, wouldn't mind uh, chipping in, I'd really appreciate it. I want to close this gap, put the last piece of the puzzle in uh, so that I can start recording that PC gameplay footage in all its HD glory. So thank you very much, uh, guys, uh, for supporting the show. Now let's uh, look at this Ale of the Week. So for the Ale of the Week, I've got a, uh, an ale from the Netherlands. So, you know, maybe I'll toast uh, Mark Verheer this, uh, this week. He's a good friend of mine from the Netherlands. So. Uh, hangs out at Armchair Arcade. Uh, this is a La Trap or La Trappy, not really sure how to say pronounce that, but it is a trip ale, which is my favorite uh, style of ale. It's a Trappist ale, so it's, this is brewed by monks, and I believe it's uh, the kind of monks that uh, don't talk, because their tagline here is taste the silence. <laughs> so, you know, we'll see uh, what happens uh, to my communicative abilities after I uh, consume this. Uh, so I was looking for where it's brewed. Uh, let's see. Uh, there it is. Uh, De Koningshoven. A uh, bunch of initials. A.G. Tilburg, the Netherlands. So as far as I can tell, <laughs> it was brewed in the Netherlands. So anyway, quite a bit of text on the bottle here. I guess they don't. Maybe they don't talk, but they uh, like to write a lot on their bottles. Got the good old cork uh, here. That's a a little class, you know. <laughs> it's a little more dramatic than just popping open a can. Let's see. Nice big bottle here. It's not very strong, apparently uh, 8% alcohol, so not too bad. Really looking uh, forward to this one. All right, so I've got the rather excellent drinking horn here ready to go. Uh, let's give it a smell. <sighs> You know, that's just like perfume. <laughs> it's just a really uh, pleasant sort of floral, flowery scent, maybe like a, a fresh peach. Uh, just really pleasant, really good stuff. Uh, you know, I wish you guys could, uh, you know, taste, <laughs> get a little whiff of that uh, through YouTube. I think you would really appreciate it, but it really makes me want to drink. So let's, uh, let me quaff this and I'll toast uh, you, uh, Mark Verheer, friend of mine from the Netherlands. Who knows, uh, maybe Mark has this ale every day. <laughs> now let's give it a taste. Now that is a very interesting uh, taste. It's, you know, it's what I would say is complex. You really don't know what to make of it. You know, you drink it and you get hit like once or twice, maybe with three different flavors in, in rapid succession. And you're trying to uh, figure out what it is you just experienced. Um, I'm sort of, you sort of got a peachy thing going. Um, but it's a little bit of, maybe like a pear uh, sort of a taste. Um, there's not much alcohol uh, taste, you know, it's not like a back, <laughs> well, like that aftertaste of uh, strong alcohol that you get with some of these. Um, actually very low key. You know, almost reminds me of uh, champagne, if you uh, can believe that. But anyway, very, very tasty, very pleasant. I think you'd be very satisfied with this ale. So if you happen to see La Trap you know, at your local ale shop, I highly recommend it. It's just uh, gorgeous stuff. All right, the quotation for this week comes from Erno Rubik, the inventor of the Rubik's Cube, and somebody who probably knows a few things about making good puzzles. And it goes something like this. A good puzzle is a fair thing. Nobody is lying. Everything is clear, and the problem depends just on you. See you guys next week. Hi guys, just wanted to uh, add a little bit to the end of this video here and tell you about a new game that I've created. It's called Match 3 Invaders. It's a hybrid game. It's, I've basically combined the gameplay of the old uh, arcade classic Space Invaders. Uh, with the uh, Match 3 games like Bejeweled and uh, Dr. Mario. And you can play that at armchairarcade.com for free right in your browser. 
Uh, it's a little cool project. I was having some fun with uh, Unity and C Sharp. Thought you might want to check it out. So anyway, enjoy and see you guys next time.